Welcome to beautiful Istanbul, uh, on a Constantinople, on a gorgeous, gorgeous late summer day. I want to welcome everyone uh, on behalf of our host, His All Holiness, Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew, who is also the heart of all of the eco ecological activities of our church. Sorry? No. <laughs> the humble and modest heart of all the ecological activities uh, and the inspiration of so many of the initiatives that uh, the Patriarchate has taken over the last 30 years. Halki Summit is uh, part of a long tradition, much like the Ecumenical Patriarchate. It is a tradition of centuries. Halki Summits also follow a long series of summer seminars, waterborne symposia, and previous Halki Summits, five of them, this is the sixth. So it doesn't stand alone, much like the Patriarch doesn't stand alone, but is 270th in a long series of ecumenical patriarchs. I want to thank His All Holiness for his presence here, for making time out of this uh, extremely busy weekend when he has the synod meetings, he has the synaxis of all the hierarchs of the ecumenical throne, to thank him for being here with us and for offering the opening address and spending a few quick minutes, hopefully with, uh, to meet you and to take um, a souvenir photograph. I also want to thank the other distinguished guests, the hierarchs that we have with us. Um, this is an exceptionally important time uh, in the calendar of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, not only because of the historic uh, synaxis, but also because of the celebration of the indiction that all of us will, will attend on Sunday, the beginning of the ecclesiastical year, and also the day of prayer for the protection of the natural environment that we've been celebrating since 1989. This is the 35th year. The venue, the name is Halki Summit. So the venue is the Halki Monastery and the school. Um, we've had international locations for the symposia, the Mediterranean, the Adriatic, the Amazon, the Mississippi. Today, this sixth Halki Summit will be held here at the Fanar, at the Maraskion School, and tomorrow at Halki. This school, as you can see, is just a spectacular um, renovation uh, and a huge gift for the Ecumenical Patriarchate that will have a venue right next door to its own um, courtyard. Over the years, the summits have had several co-sponsors, various institutions. Some of the conferences were held in uh, association with the Royal Family in the UK, with the United Nations, with the European Parliament. We've held uh, conferences and summits with academic and ecological organizations, including, in the case of the Halki Summit, first the Southern Hampshire, New Hampshire University, and most recently, Sophia University, our last summit. And this year, Hellenic Open University, where Professor Ioannis Kalavruziotis has graciously worked with us to organize this event in a very smooth and fruitful collaboration. Talking about collaborations, numerous books have come out from the various conferences, the symposia, and from the Halki Summits. The very latest one is the Proceedings of Halki Summit 5, published by Holy Cross Orthodox Press, which is directed by His Grace Bishop Anthony. And uh, this year, the talks will be published as an e-book with the generous initiative of Professor Calvaruziotis at the Hellenic Open University. Before inviting Professor Calvaruziotis uh, to speak for uh, a brief moment just to greet us, I want to acknowledge in thanks a couple of people. First of all, again, His All Holiness for his moral support, his material support, and his personal presence. Professor Kalevruziotis and the Open University, the managers of our two hotels, the Petrion and the Troya, and especially Ms. Semiha at the Troya for the summit dinners and meals and for accommodating last-minute changes. 
Our hosts tomorrow, Bishop Cassianos and Father Miletios. The team on the ground are done. Where is she? Somewhere. Who's uh, just proved invaluable in her assistance and her setting up. My own executive assistant, Elena Condogli from the Huffington Ecumenical Institute, who is always doing the things I can't do. Father Hieronymus Sotirelis, who's not here right now, but really, you should know as well, Your Royal Holiness, um, it would not have been possible without his assistance. He really has come through in flying colors. But also to all of you, a thank you, speakers and participants. I hope you'll take this opportunity, not only to experience the rich traditions of the Ecumenical Patriarchate and the Queen of Cities, Istanbul, as well as the island and the monastery of Halki, but especially, I would say, the unique context of what makes these Halki summits work, and that is the context of forging friendships, forging networks, because it's only in working together, scientists, theologians, politicians, journalists, that we can better respond, better appreciate the ecological crisis today. Professor Kalavruziotis, President of the Hellenic Open University, for a brief greeting. Your all Holiness, Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew, Bishops, Sebastiotati, Reverend Fathers, Ladies and Gentlemen. As the scientific field of my specialization is the water and waste, water and biosolids management, with which I have been working for 30 years, and the subject of this summit school is the water spirit and science, I would like to transfer to you my experiences and thoughts about the possible direction of the modern water technology and the spiritual aspects of water as used by our Orthodox faith. Basically, to put it in a synoptic way, the present uh, summit Halki 2024 is going to examine the water in relation to the unity of cosmos and in reference to the monastic ethos, as well as in relation to contribution of the sustainable management of water blessing. The later subjects will be presented by theologians. All the above mentioned constitute the core of Bible teachings about the spiritual aspects of water and in this respect one may ask the following question. question. What could be the relationship between the material and the cosmic science of water technology with the spiritual water and more generally with the spiritual Bible? Also, what results could possibly yield such an interaction? The answer of these questions can be found in the book of Genesis, calling us human beings to show responsive care for the earth, for the crea creatures, and for the environment. And more specifically, we must care about the preserving the natural environment, respecting the creation, applying sustainable practices in agriculture, reducing consumption as much as possible, and reusing and recycling water ever we consider as waste. Closing my short uh, greetings, I feel strongly the need to stress that uh, the present generations must display responsibility towards delivering and presenting to the coming generations a healthy environment by making everything possible to follow the useful exploitation of the science and the Bible. I also wish to express my sincere thanks to Ecumenical Patriarch Bartolomeo and Father Ioannis for organizing this summit Halki 2024. Thank you for your attention. I'd like to invite Professor Volkan Oral from the Istanbul Aydin University. One of the characteristic features of the Ministry of His All Holiness is the 
forging of connections, connections with other churches, connections with other churches, connections with other institutions. And every time we do hold a Halki summit, we try to have a connection with one of the local universities. In this case, it's uh, Professor Oral's university, who's also a friend of Professor Kalavuziotis. Good morning. You're all Holiness Ecumenical Patrick Bartolomeu, ladies and gentlemen, dear guests and distinguished speakers. Welcome to Istanbul, the city of where the East meet mass. Welcome to our conference on water spread and science. As we gather here today, we stand on the brink of an essential dialogue that connects to the profound spiritual significance of water with the rigorous scientific insights that guide our understanding of this vital resource. Water is the essential component of all life, not just the material. It penetrates our ecosystem, supporting many species and fostering the interdependent web of life. In many civilizations, water is associated with the rebirth, purity, and spiritual wisdom. It is honored in rituals and is regarded as a separate component that unites people with the periods of the natural world and supernatural period. This spiritual viewpoint serves as a reminder of the respect and reverence of that water resource. But science is a necessary tool in our search for sustainability and the health of our planet. Our water resources are being put under never-before-seen pressure from pollution, population increase, and climate change. More than 2 million people, according to research, reside in nations where there is a shortage of water. To bring human needs and the natural world back into the balance, our field of science has worked continuously to investigate nature-based solutions. The significance of circularity, ensuring that the water is used, reused, and preserved through creative methods is emphasized by this solution. I'm asking each of you to consider how we may bring these two viewpoints, the spiritual and the scientific, together as we begin our talks today. Let us embrace cutting-edge research and technology while searching for the wisdom found in conventional knowledge systems. Throughout this conference, we will hear from the leading experts who will share insights on various topics, including water conservation techniques, equitable access to clean water, and strategies for integrating spiritual practices into our sustainable tea force. A speaker will contribute unique perspectives, and I encourage you to engage fully with them, allowing the seeds of knowledge to blossom into actionable ideas. Finally, Let's remember that water has become a common pathway that unites all of us and is more than just a resource. It encourages us to work together, be creative, and respect the fine line that divides our spiritual conviction from our understanding of science. Together, we can forge a future rooted on sustainability, respect for the environment, and one in which water is valued, protected, and enjoyed. Thank you, and welcome once again to Water, Spirit, and Science. Once again, good morning. Welcome to our beautiful and hospitable city of Istanbul. And uh, enjoy your time here in the Fanar and tomorrow in Halki. Venerable hierarchs, distinguished participants and guests, it is a privilege and pleasure to be addressing this opening session of the 6th Halki Summit, dedicated this year to the subject of water in its spiritual and scientific dimensions. And it is with paternal joy and satisfaction that we welcome you to the Fanar as the sacred sea of the Orthodox Church which has initiated an, ex an exhaustive and comprehensive series of pioneering and inspiring events for the sake of raising awareness and disseminating knowledge about the preservation and protection of the unique gift of God's creation. All of you, uh, bring specific and special talents toward this end. And it is our earnest hope and prayer that this summit will once again forge new friendships and relationships while expanding and extending invaluable networks in a world 
that is hungry for such encounters and relationships. As you know, the involvement of the ecumenical patriarchate in caring and praying for the natural environment dates back to 1989, when our late predecessor, ecumenical patriarch Demetrius, established September 1st, the day of indiction, as the formal day of intercessions for God's creation. Since then, all Orthodox churches and subsequently other Christian confessions, but also the World Council of Churches and the European and the Conference of European Churches, and more recently the Anglican Communion and the Roman Catholic Church have adopted this universal feast and commemoration. Since that time, the ecological initiatives of the Ecumenical Patriarchate have included events with the late Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, and especially a sequence of five inter-Orthodox summer seminars, nine interdisciplinary ecological symposia at sea, and now six international Halki summits. You are therefore, all of you, part of a long succession of dedicated gatherings which have assembled countless religious, civil and political leaders, theologians and scientists, journalists and activists, women and men, who have convened from all parts of the globe, from the Amazon River and the Adriatic Sea to the Arctic Ocean and the Black Sea, as well as from the Baltic to the Mediterranean Sea. Today, Halki Summit 6 is advancing this invaluable and inclusive tradition. Our esteemed speakers will address a broad range of theological and scientific aspects of water. You will, bear, uh, hear, you will hear about the significance and sacredness of water in classical Greece, in the Holy Scriptures, and in the liturgical services. You will learn about spiritual and educational dimensions of water, as well as about water in recent history, in sustainable development and solutions for management. And you will be informed about specific responses to issues related to water in Greece and the Netherlands. Throughout, we encourage you to seek avenues of collaboration and partnership. This is precisely what lies behind our precious co-sponsorship and cooperation with the Hellenic Open University this year, for which we are grateful to its president, Professor Ioannis Kalavuzgiotis, a dear friend of ours. Dear friends, water has always been more than just a physical necessity. It has been deeply embedded in the spiritual and the religious consciousness of humanity. Across various cultures and religions, water has been perceived as a symbol of life. In Christianity, it signifies purification, regeneration, and initiation. Christ's baptism in the Jordan River marks the beginning of his ministry and the blessing of the entire universe. In Judaism, water is a central part of feasts and laws. And in Islam, water is considered a gift from the divine and a sign of sustenance. Rites of washing are fundamental in all three of these Abrahamic religions. Moreover, as we have repeatedly emphasized, but as we particularly underlined during our symposium on the Amazon 
in 2006, indigenous and tribal religions around the world understand water bodies such as rivers, lakes, and springs as inhabited by spirits or deities. However, let us focus here on the perception of water in Christianity and Byzantium. We have already noted that water is at the heart of the sacrament of baptism, which symbolizes the washing away of the old Adam and the rebirth into the new Adam. In, this, in his epistles, the Apostle Paul further elaborates on the significance of baptism when he writes in Romans chapter 6. Do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Here, St. Paul highlights the transformative power of baptism. The roots of this conviction lie in the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament, where water is used in cleansing rituals, rituals for those who seek restoration in spiritual cleanliness. For us, of course, Christ himself is the living water, to either to zone. And whoever drinks from this water will never thirst. Indeed, this water will become a spring of water unto eternal life. Moreover, water plays a crucial role in several of Christ's miracles, foremost in the first of his public signs, namely at the changing of water into wine at the wedding in Cana, which prefigures Christ's transformative ministry throughout the Eucharist. Even in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, water holds vital importance with the vision of the river of life that portrays the ultimate fulfillment of God's promise of salvation for the whole world. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. 22nd chapter of Revelation. It is no wonder then that water was of essential value in the religious, artistic, and cultural identity of Byzantium. Beyond the importance of baptism, along with the religious depictions of Christ's baptism in frescoes and mosaics, all of which reinforced the sacred nature of water, Byzantium, and especially its capital, Constantinople, was renowned for its advanced engineering in water management. The city was equipped with sophisticated aqueducts, cisterns, and public fountains, uh, showcasing the Byzantine's ability to harness and utilize water if effectively and just. One of the most remarkable examples is the Basilica cistern, an enormous underground reservoir built in the 6th century during the reign of Emperor Justinian I. 
the architectural in ingenuity of the cistern with its forest of marble columns not only served practical needs but also reflected the aesthetic and cultural values of the time. You will have the opportunity personally to witness many of the surviving remnants of this legacy as you travel around the city. But water also held a prominent place in Byzantine literature and poetry, where water was frequently used as a metaphor for life, purity, and the divine. Byzantine hymnographers often referred to water drawing on its biblical connotations and its importance in the sacraments. In Byzantine iconography, water also symbolized both life and death, often depicted as the life-giving boundary between the earthly and the divine, for instance, in depictions of the Last Judgment. Beloved participants and guests, while we remember the sacred and historical perspectives of water, we must also address, in fact, we should, because of the emergency crisis, the contemporary challenge of water that we encounter in the world today. Water has literally become a critical resource in our age. We recognize that water is essential for life, underpinning uh, health, food security, economic prosperity, and environmental sustainability. However, despite this fundamental and vital importance, we are now facing an escalating global water crisis that demands immediate attention and collective approach. <coughs> Globally, well over 2 billion people lack access to safe drinking water, and more than 4 billion regularly experience severe water scarcity. The data is staggering and highlights the compelling need to address equitable water accessibility, water quality, and water sustainability. Moreover, the scarcity of clean water disproportionately affects vulnerable populations, further exacerbating inequality and hindering balanced development. By the same token, climate change is intensifying the water crisis by altering precipitation patterns, increasing the frequency and severity of droughts and floods, while at the same time accelerating the melting of glaciers. These changes disrupt the availability and distribution of fresh water resources, threatening ecosystems and human communities alike. For example, the shrinking of glacier, uh, glaciers reduces water supplies for millions who rely on glacial melt for drinking water and agriculture. In addition to this, agriculture accounts for approximately 70% of global fresh water usage. Yet, as the global population continues to grow, the demand for food and therefore water will increase drastically. Efficient water management practices and sustainable agriculture techniques are crucial to ensure food security without depleting our fresh water resources. And there are so many other collateral damages provoked by rapid urbanization and industrialization, which further strain water resources. 
cities around the world are expanding. And with this growth comes increased water demand for domestic, industrial, and infrastructure use. Urban areas struggle with aging water infrastructure, leading to significant water loss and contamination. Addressing these challenges requires substantial investment in water infrastructure and innovative management practices. Finally, on a daily basis, we all see the impact of the water crisis on the health of our planet, as well as the well-being of our fellow citizens. Water pollution is a major threat to human health and ecosystems. Industrial discharges, agricultural runoff, and untreated sewage contaminate water bodies, making them unsafe for consumption and harming aquatic life. Contaminated water is a breeding ground for diseases, contributing to the deaths of millions of people each year, particularly children. Ensuring access to clean water and sanitation is not just a matter of infrastructure, but also of public health. At the same time, water scarcity and poor water quality have profound economic implications. Industries depend on water, such as agriculture, energy production, and manufacturing face disruptions that can lead to economic losses and job cuts. Moreover, communities without reliable water access experience reduced productivity and increased health care costs, perpetuating cycles of poverty. These are the sort of issues you will be addressing this year at this sixth Halki Summit. We have long drawn attention to water as a central focus in the climate crisis. This is not least because of the immediate and unambiguous connections and ramifications between our human body, the body of our planet, and the body of Christ. Whether you will speak of the sacredness of water or about the sustain sustainability of water, whether you will speak about healing through water or efficiency through management of water, whether you will stress the dimension of the heavenly kingdom or investment in earthly infrastructure, whether you discuss salvation or conservation, prayer for or protection of water, in the end you are remembering and reminding each other that water is an urgent resource that requires our immediate and constant attention. It is only with collective action and innovative solutions that we will address the challenges of respecting water as an essential component of life on earth, on earth and salvation in heaven. Together, we can protect and preserve this precious resource for current and future generations. Thank you for your attention. May God bless your deliberations and may you enjoy your visit to the Fanar and to Hal.